Are you the owner of a startup or the president of a major corporation? Are you ready to grow into a leader your people can't wait to follow? Well, if you answered yes to any of those questions, Claire Chandler, the president and founder of Talent Boost, says the biggest impact on a company's culture is the behavior of its leaders. She joined me this week to provide a positive pathway forward for business executives, both big and small, to becoming effective leaders. I'm Kevin McShann. Let's have this conversation. to the show and we're excited uh, to talk to you about the growth of uh, small business in this pandemic we're living in. So great to see you this morning and then thanks for being here. Great to see you. It's a pleasure to be here. So Claire, I know uh, that you have a big philosophy of having the biggest impact on a company's culture is the behavior of its people. So I'm wondering if you could expand for me on that philosophy and sort of rallying cry uh, that you've adopted. Yeah, I, I, I would love to. Um, you know, it's it has been said that the, the number one um, impact on an employee's engagement is their relationship with their direct manager. Um, but the ability to really thrive and contribute positively to a culture um, is, is really more largely driven by the behavior of the leaders at the very top of an organization. Um, so, you know, my, my rallying cry, and I love that phrase, um, is that the, the, the biggest impact on a company's culture is the behavior of its leaders. And the reason I say that is because, you know, we have all worked for leaders that have run the gamut from really, really inspiring to really, really abysmal. <laughs> and it, you know, it, it of course um, affects how, um, how we feel about reporting into work every day, how we feel about bringing our best ideas, our best energy, our best mood, um, you know, to that environment. And you know the, the leaders that are inspirational lift us up and energize us and you know make us want to um, contribute at higher levels. And um, you know the, the the less effective leaders obviously have the opposite effect. And and employees are paying attention, right? A lot of executives say, well, you know they they shouldn't be worried so much about what we do here on the top. Um, you know they should just sort of focus on their job. But it really, you know, in my experience, um, you know, both uh, being spending almost 20 years in, in corporate America and working with leaders now as a consultant, um, you know, it's, it, it is very clear to me that the more they embrace their duty to be um, not just guides for the business, but moral guides to the culture that they're trying to create, the more successful they will be in the long run. Now, in this new normal, what have you been telling people in terms of business leaders to how to survive uh, the current health crisis we're living in? Yeah, it's, you know, it's, it's surreal, right? It really is this, this time that we're living in and the, and the global pandemic. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm a bit of an eternal optimist, so I do try to look for what are the positives that can possibly come out of this? And, and one of them is that this is truly a globally shared experience that no one has ever seen the likes of before. And, you know, a lot of leaders are very hesitant to, um, to admit that they don't have all the answers. You know, they put a lot of pressure on themselves that 
they have to, uh, it's sort of like a parent of young children, right? You have to, you have to always know the answers to the questions that your children ask you. Um, and as leaders, it, it's, it is a bit of a mistake um, to try to pretend that you know all the answers because you couldn't possibly. And, you know, one of the things that, that COVID has taught us is that no one has all the answers. So what better opportunity than now, you know, to, to acknowledge, hey, listen, this is new for everybody. Um, you know, we need to come together in ways that perhaps we've never done before and figure out how to get through this. Um, so to more directly answer your question, you know, I think it's a combination of um, there are some very real near term um, fires that need to be put out as business leaders to keep the doors open, to keep payroll funded, to keep customers satisfied. But the leaders at the very top of an organization also need to always keep one eye on that longer term horizon. Um, because if they don't, they're not going to be able to pull their people through to the other side of this. And tell me, what uh, advantages do you think uh, technology will play for businesses as they look for ways to advance uh, their companies in this uncertain time? Yeah, great question. You know, I, I think technology, um, had this happened even 10 years ago, I think many, many more businesses would uh, be forced to close. And unfortunately, a lot of businesses are being forced to close. But one of the things that technology has enabled a lot of companies to do is to pivot to a different way of working, a more remote way of working. Um, you know, things like um, the laptops that can still, you know, log in to servers from wherever you might be. Um, video conferencing capabilities that are low cost or no cost that enable teams to continue to meet. Um, those are things that I think uh, have really helped companies make that pivot that a lot of them have been considering doing um, for years. They just weren't sure how and when and, you know, if we do flexible uh, working or if we let people work from home, is it going to be, you know, chaos? And I think they are, they are pleasantly surprised at the level of productivity they're seeing from their workforce. Um, and the other thing that I think has been on the rise, um, pleasantly so, is collaboration. Um, I think, you know, workers at the ground level who were so used to, oh, you know, I have a, I have a quick question for somebody down the hall. Next time I see him when I walk down there, I'll ask him the question. Well, now there's more of a purpose to um, reaching out to them and saying, you know, hey, Kevin, can we hop on a video conference? Um, you know, let's schedule 30 minutes and let's brainstorm a solution to this current problem. Um, so I'm finding that with the, with the clients and the companies that I work with, um, that the technology has actually been improving collaboration and productivity. Now, in terms of small business, when we look at uh, the U.S. Labor uh, Bureau of Statistics, they report that on average, 20% of small businesses fail in their first year and then 50% and then in their fifth year. So can you tell me what are some of the common uh, pitfalls that businesses, particularly small businesses, fall into and what would be your message to anyone looking to start a small business during this time? Yeah, uh, great, great question. Um, you know, it, I'll, I'll kind of take the second part first. You know, starting a small business is kind of like starting a family, right? There's no ideal time to start that. And it's just one of those things that it has to become a, a bit of a passion project for you. Um, you have to be passionate about starting a business at any time, let alone in, in, in 2020. Um, and you really have to believe in it, but you also have to be careful that passion does not become a blind spot for you, um, that you become so in love with the concept of running your own business that you lose sight of doing the practical things that are required to keep that business going. Um, one of the things that um, will, will never change, regardless of whether it's 2020 and we're in the midst of a, of a pandemic or it's you know, a, a, a period of, of a very strong economy where a lot of businesses thrive, um, the best businesses, the most successful and the ones that are going to survive this type of a, of a downturn caused by a pandemic 
are the ones that are built on clarity. And what I mean by that is when you first open a business as a solopreneur, as a startup, as a family run business, um, even as a small business, you're typically very clear on who you are, what you're very good at and who you want to serve. As you start to grow and as you add people to your workforce, that message or that purpose or that mission um, can become very diluted if you're not careful. Um, so clarity of mission, clarity of purpose, um, as you move forward and especially as you start to add people to your team, um, it is, is one of those fundamentals that is essential for the survival and thriving of a business. And I know that talk to me about your whirlpool effect, a revolutionary way which aligns your leaders and teams around a unifying vision which attracts, retains, and motivates the right talent to achieve the mission you've created. Sure, I'd be happy to. So the, so the Whirlpool effect started out as a bit of nostalgia. So, you know, I, I had been working with, with companies and with leaders and with businesses for years. And, you know, I was, I was trying to find a metaphor that would resonate in a way that was unique, um, you know, to, to all the other kind of noise out there. Um, Cause there's a lot of consultants. There's a lot of, uh, you know, people that uh, can, can sort of advise businesses. And I was struck by a childhood memory. So I, I live in New Jersey. I grew up in New Jersey and the summers here are quite hot. And it was always the, the kid on our block with a swimming pool was always the most popular, right? So everyone would gather there and all the kids in the neighborhood would, would go to that pool. And on a hot summer day when we were all swimming, invariably, one of the kids in the pool would, would say, whirlpool, let's make a whirlpool. And we all knew what that meant. It meant whatever we were doing, we just stopped and we started to kind of trot in a circle in the pool a couple of times, a couple of revolutions, until we created a whirlpool effect. And once that happened, you could pick up your feet and be swept along with that current. Um, and the more I thought about that and how much fun it was and how easy it was to get on board with such a simple message, the more it translated for me into leadership. And so when I bring that into, you know, through the lens of business, what it means to, to um, create a whirlpool effect in business is that leaders who have a very clear, very simple message that employees can attach personal meaning to and can see how they can contribute to it, they're going to get on board, they're going to be enthusiastic. And what ends up happening is you now have a leader who people follow enthusiastically and they contribute their best time, uh, their best talents, their best ideas, and they just get swept along in the flow of what that whirlpool creates. So that became a metaphor for me in business and working with leaders to say, you know, a, a, lot of, a lot of people aspire to leadership and once they get there, they're disillusioned because they say, it, it, it's just not as fun as I thought it would be. It's a lot more um, work certainly, but it's, but it's not even fulfilling. And I don't know, you know, how I got here and teaching them how to create this whirlpool effect, um, reignites in them, their passion for leadership, why they're in a leadership role in the first place and how to do it in such a way that is fun and is easier to bring people along. Fascinating. Now I'm just wondering also, what the, what's your key, do you think, to uh, stimulating economic growth during the time that we're living in as well? Yeah, um, you know, it's, it, it is going to start, um, I, I, I would love to have enough faith at the, at the federal level to say, well, well, we'll get enough stimulus to sort of get the economy going. Um, but I think companies have, um, you know, an opportunity to, to sort of do this themselves. And I think the way that they will do this is to, you know, with the rising unemployment, there's an opportunity as businesses, you know, come to terms with the fact that COVID is not going away anytime soon. This is something we're going to have to live and work alongside um, potentially for years. 
the, the, the business and economic effects of it will be felt for years. Um, and so, you know, leaders really need to come to grips with that and say, we can't wait for it to magically disappear. We need to um, move on with business, move forward with business and bring our people along. So there's an opportunity to stimulate the economy at a business and a company by company level by bringing into their workforce, um, you know, in, in, in two ways, bringing back the workforce they have in a very strategic way of re-onboarding their existing employees into, you know, this is what we've always been about, this is how we've changed, and this is who we are going forward. But then the way they really will stimulate the economy is to add to that workforce the right talent, not just the available talent, but the right talent that's going to help them fulfill their mission and move them closer to fulfilling their vision. That's how we, we re-stimulate the economy one company at a time. Yeah, I've got two more questions for you. In terms of, I'm, I'm also curious, as you may know from doing uh, your research on me, I have what's called a uh, spastic quadrupedal cerebral palsy. So it just similar means that I don't have enough oxygen in my legs to walk normally. So I'm just curious to know, what is your advice or what do you think about stimulating opportunities for people with disabilities? Oh, what a great question. Um, you know, it, 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 to me, it ties back into the, the technology, you know, your, your question about technology and the impact it has had. Um, and technology is not the, you know, it's not the solution to everything, but it has enabled companies to, um, to keep their businesses going and to keep their workforces productive. Um, and, and the great thing about technology is it, 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 it woke businesses up to the fact that they can still get a lot of work done and in fact you know have have a workforce that's more productive that's more engaged through the use of technology um, and so even though they were kind of forced into this pivot of allowing remote work and allowing flexible work and allowing people to you know maybe take more breaks in the middle of the day to attend to their children or to attend to you know medical appointments um, knowing they were going to get their work done at you know at some point during the day um, what, what that awakening did for, for employers, I think they are also, um, becoming much more aware that, um, you know, differently abled people can make a very positive, very strong contribution, um, especially because technology has enabled their current workforce, you know, whether they're, they're, you know, fully able, disabled, remote, et cetera. Um, you know, to contribute in ways that um, fit in with their lifestyle best. So I think this, you know, this pandemic, which forced a pivot to alternate ways of working, is also forcing um, a much greater awareness, acceptance, and empowerment from the employer side to, um, you know, employees and prospective employees who, um, you know, may look different may think differently, may bring different skills to the table, may have different ways of getting from point A to point B, um, but are enabled through technology and through other ways of working more than ever before. Um, so I'm, you know, I'm, I'm encouraged by, you know, again, I'm, I'm an eternal optimist. So I'm encouraged by what the global pandemic has, has managed to achieve in um, kind of shaking the, the dust and the antiquated ways of, of getting work done and looking at employees, um, you know, off a, off a lot of these, these companies. So, I, so I'm encouraged about the future, especially for, you know, employees of all abilities. And then my final question for you is, what do you envision as the future of entrepreneurship, both in America and then globally as well? Yeah, I, I honestly think that it is a great time to be an entrepreneur. Um, even before COVID struck, we were seeing the rise of the gig economy. Um, you know, people like myself who, you know, I, like I said, I spent close to 20 years in, in corporate America and didn't really have a plan when I decided to take a leap of faith and, and form my own consulting business. Um, and it's something that, you know, probably 10 to 15 years prior, I would not have been as positioned to do. 
um, because the, you know, I think the global economy and the US economy just didn't have the appetite um, to the level that they do now of bringing in hired talent for specific projects, for specific verticals, for specific um, purposes. And so I think the rise of entrepreneurship is only going to continue um, and it's going to be amplified by COVID because I think, you know, COVID has, has struck at the heart of a lot of businesses who did have to change the way they, they worked, who did have to furlough or lay off um, significant portions of their workforce. And so they're going to be looking to bring in um, more strategic um, strikes of, of talent. And that I think is, uh, is sort of a, a, a gap of knowledge and expertise that entrepreneurs are uniquely positioned to fill. Claire, we want to thank you for a few minutes and uh, for taking some time to talk to us about the future of small business and entrepreneurship in America. I really enjoyed the perspectives. I want to thank you for your time this morning. Thanks so much for being here. Thanks, Kevin. It was a pleasure.